Welcome to Jesus Experience. You are designed to receive from God the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. And through the life of Christ in you, you will live and affect the world around you. Now, here is Dr. Gary V. Whetstone. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I know y'all all smile. How many of y'all smiling under your mask? I got to tell some of your eyes are all wrinkled up and everything. <laughs> Amen. You can be seated this morning. We're so glad to have you here this morning. And uh, it's just a great day to be alive and if you got your bulletin this morning at the top of the bulletin, it says it's our time, a life of evangelism. And, you know, we've uh, taken these past two weeks and that's what we're focusing on. And um, if you have your Bibles there, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24. Before you do that, how many of you were here last Sunday? How many of you were? Some of some, I see some faces that weren't here. And I shared with this app that I uh, put on my phone and uh, I wanted to pull it up again. It's called World Meters. You can go to to the Play Store, if you're on your uh, Android, I think a pro I think they probably have the same app if you go to the uh, Apple Store and everything. And uh, we shared last week that, according to the Centers for the Study of Global Christianity, there's about approximately 2.5 billion Christians on the planet today. That's as of 2019. Obviously, there's much more now because there's been evangelism going on throughout the year. But then. <clears throat> According to world meters, the world population right now is about 7.8 billion and is fast approaching 7.9 billion. Last week, if you remember, I shared it was about 45 million people that died last week. And some, you know, we believe God that most of them went to heaven, but some of them didn't go to heaven. But as of today, it's almost 47 million. So you can see that in just a week's time, over 2 million people have stepped into eternity. And so what I want to do, I want to challenge you today, and I want to challenge you from the Word of God and from what Jesus said. And if you have your Bibles this morning, now, they have my notes, but I added a, a, a portion of Scripture to, uh, to the teaching today. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to read a little bit out of here. I may do a little side journey today. I'm, how many of you know we're led by the Spirit? Even though I have notes, we're, you know, we, we allow the Holy Spirit to direct us. And I believe one of the most awesome things that, that we're experiencing in the body of Christ, we're experiencing the, the revelation of his new and living way, the eight aspects of what Jesus uh, uh, did as a result of his death, burial, resurrection, you know, everything that he did uh, through the power of his cross. But I believe because of the season of time that we're in, that all across the world there's an awakening in the body of Christ for, for the passion for souls. Everyone say passion for souls, passion for the lost. <clears throat> Now, I did not lead anybody to the Lord this week. I was a little, you know, a little, you know, but I got to, I got to share, I got to plant uh, and water a lot of the word of God in people's lives and different things. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in just a few moments. But in Matthew chapter 24, <coughs> excuse me, I love this. It says, and Jesus went out. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to share your word. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher in the body of Christ. And Lord, we just yield to you in this time. Lord, we thank you that. Uh, my tongue becomes as a pen of a ready writer to write your word upon the tablets of, my, of our hearts today. Lord, that the entrance of your word brings light and gives us understanding. And Lord, we thank you that you've raised us up, Lord, to herald and to trumpet the power of the cross of Jesus Christ and to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation. And then shall the end come. So Lord, we just give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said... In Matthew chapter 24, the scripture reads as this, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And he said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to uh, travel to Israel? Anybody here ever had the opportunity to travel to Israel? If you ever get the chance, I encourage you to go. I had the opportunity to go twice, and the, 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 the temple area is, is so, it's so amazing. Because you see these huge stones, and it's amazing how they cut. They're almost perfectly cut and everything. So it's amazing the technology that they had to have at that time, but how they were able to, to you know, to build uh, the temple at that time. And right now, the uh, Western Wall is still up, and you'll see the rabbis, and you'll see the men. You know, they're putting, they put in little prayer requests in the, in the stones and different things. And, uh, I, I mean, in the, um, in the, in the little slots there uh, of, the, of those temple stones and everything. But exactly what Jesus said. I believe it was around A.D. 7 when the uh, Romans came in and sacked Israel that a lot of those stones were 
overthrown and the temple was torn down and everything. And there is going to be a temple that's rebuilt. That's going to take place in, the, in these last days sometime. And so that's where they were at. They were, they were astonished at the beauty of the temple. And, you know, it was a great place where they kind of reveled in its, its beauty and its stature. Verse 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives, is, it's like a hill. It's not like, a real, it's not like Mount Everest. And it's pretty much right across. Um, there's like a little valley. And when you're in the Mount of Olives, you can, you can see the, um, the entire uh, wall that's around Israel, you know, to this day. And you can kind of look into the old city and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. And so that's where they were at. He says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there's three questions that they wanted to have answered. First of all, they wanted to know when the temple, was, those rocks were going to be um, thrown down. Number two, they wanted to know what shall be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world. So this, this portion of scripture has always interested me. Even when I was a little boy and I wasn't really walking uh, with the Lord, um, you'll probably get a kick out of this. I always used to read this portion of scripture, but I, w- I would always read Revelation, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And because I didn't understand it, I would have nightmares, you know, because it would talk about the four horsemen and the flames coming out, you know, and I would have like nightmares of like Godzilla coming through the backyard and tearing up the house and different things or whatever. But for some reason, I always had a fascination with these end time scriptures. And I'm not like some, I'm not like some uh, Bible prophecy teacher, but it just kind of was stirred into my heart and everything. And I would read this portion of scripture, probably starting around when I was about 11 years old, I really got interested in it. And so there was those three questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, how many of you think that's so pretty important questions to answer? And so what I encourage you to do is maybe take some time and go through these scriptures and everything because here's what happens. And um, I've kind of been in a couple different times where the body of Christ kind of got in an uproar and they thought it was, this, you, know, the, you know, Jesus was returning and different things. And I remember the first time was probably around 1973, you know, there was an uh, energy crisis and different things going on and, you know, they, they were, the planet was supposed to be cooling down and, you know, we, they were, we were supposed to be running out of oil and everything and stuff like that. And obviously we didn't run out of oil. You know, one thing about God, God is a, bond of, uh, is a God of abundance. So anytime you hear somebody talking about a shortage or whatever like that, don't believe it. Don't believe it. God, look at your neighbor and say, God is a God of abundance. And let me, so, so God is not, God is not surprised that there's 7.8 billion people on the planet right now. There's plenty, there's plenty of food and resources to sustain life until Jesus returns. The, in, in, a, in the book of Genesis, it says, as long, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, summer and winter, hot and cold. So there's always going to be different seasons and different things. That's why I love the scripture. The scripture is so awesome. So in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto him, take heed that no man deceive you. So now I want to I kind of focus on this. It's very critical in our generation that you operate in truth. Everyone say truth. Now, if you know anything about truth, and it doesn't matter what arena, it, it could be finances, it, the, the, thing, the, the thing of God, truth is not just laying on the surface. You got to dig for it. That means we, as Christians, we can't be lazy when it comes to the word of God. It can't be lazy when it comes to uh, uh, raising our children. We can't be lazy when it comes to financial things. We can't be lazy, even, like, even in this political arena, we can't be lazy and just don't, we got we to dig for information. You got to dig for it. I don't have time to... Um, you know, pastor asked us to read in the book of Proverbs, you know, take some time in the book of Proverbs and study about wisdom this week. Wisdom is you have to search for it. You have to dig for it. You have to, you have to take action. Wisdom is not just kind of out there. You have, to, you have to dig for it. So he said, take heed that no man deceive you. So in my life, I recognize that I cannot afford to not have truth. Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will, it'll make you free. It sets you free. It makes you free. Truth. Everyone say Truth. And Jesus said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. That says no man deceive you. And then he goes on and he says, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So deception is something that's an earmark of the last days. Okay. And so anyhow, growing up, you know, these, you know, these uh, people, they would start hoarding food. And I, I remember in the 70s, we were, you know, um, we were a part of, a, my parents were a part of an association of churches and everything. And these people, man, they started putting all kinds of things on their credit cards and take, you know, because they thought, well, man, you know, we might as well splurge because Jesus is going to come, you know, and everything like that, which if you think about it is a really creepy attitude to have, you know. And so what ended up happening, Jesus didn't return at that time. And a lot of people got in debt and a lot of people were destroyed. You know, they were hoarding food and everything and stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong. And let, let me share this. There's nothing wrong with having a little extra food 
and, you know, a, a little extra supply. But if you start getting into this panic where, oh, man, you know, there's going to be food shortages and all this other kind of stuff, anything of fear is a lie. Fear, there's a really interesting acronym, fear. If you write, write F-E-A-R, it's false evidence appearing real. Now, there's nothing wrong with having some, you know, extra food in your, you know, in your uh, cabinets. I know every people, you know, my, my wife, she was funny, man, when they, when they talked about toilet paper, you know, kind of sure, man, she, she was buying toilet paper. I'm, I'm, I'm like, honey, you know, praise the Lord, but, you know, but we got toilet paper. I think we got enough to last us, you know, <laughs> for another couple of years or whatever. Thank God, you know, hallelujah. I'm not complaining about it, you know. How, how many of you are excited about toilet paper, you know? And then he goes on, so, so deception is going to be prevalent. Everyone say deception. So there's a, and, and all, all you have to do, there's deception everywhere. And so we have to anchor in the things of Jesus Christ. Then, um, how, how many of you remember the um, year 2000, they, they talked about the, the, the computers were going to shut down and air, airplanes are going to come flying out the house. So let me tell you about my lovely wife. She's probably watching, right? So anyhow, <laughs> I didn't believe it. Because to me, if, if there's going to be something major happening in the world, I think Jesus would have said something in the scripture. You know, and so, so anyhow, so she was kind of getting a little, you know, she was, once again, she was getting things and everything. And, you know, the, uh, the IT people, they were telling us, yes, when this clock hits uh, two, uh, December 31st, you know, 2000, you know, something's going to happen with the computer chips and all the computers going to freeze up, the electric, you know, the... Uh, uh, the electric grid is going to go down. We're, pro we're probably going to return to the Stone Age and everything. And see, once again, anytime I hear something that's communicated with fear, I don't go with it. How many, how many ever had fear about something and the thing you feared never even came to pass? Every one of us has. You know why? Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of love and of power and of a sound mind. See, if you, year, if you yield to fear, and I'm going a little bit direction, a different direction, somebody needs to hear this. Anytime you yield to fear... You're going to make crazy decisions. You're going to make unwise decisions. Just like I said about those believers in the 70s, you know, they were running up. And at that time, you know, um, interest rates were like 18 percent, you know, uh, on mortgages. People were uh, remortgaging their houses and doing all these things and taking trips and all these kind of things or whatever. And the challenge is they didn't have a focus on soul winning. Because I'm kind of getting ahead of myself or whatever like that. The ultimate reason that Jesus wanted to give us the signs of the, of the, of the end times is not for self-preservation. It's for us to have an urgency so that we can reap this world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just think how selfish we would be in the body of Christ. And just think how selfish Jesus would, would have been if he put in the scripture. Now, let me tell you something. In the last days, there's going to be famines and everything like that. So I want you to make sure that you have a 60-day supply of dried foods. Make sure you have your freezers full and everything and stuff like that and stay hunkered down in your houses and everything like that because it's going to be really bad or whatever like that. Not, you know, um, and you know, I don't want you to tell nobody about me because you might get a little persecution or whatever like that. that. That don't even sound like Jesus, does it? No. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him would not perish but have everlasting life. See, one of, that, one of the earmarks of a Christian is that we love not our lives to the death that we're not just concerned about our own lives. We have the greatest life that exists now. We have eternal life now. Eternal life is not when you take your last breath and you step into heaven. We have eternal life now. You're an eternal being right now. You know, if you're here today and you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have eternal life. You just have a different address than believers have. So then Jesus goes on to say, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. Now, how many times have we seen in, you know, Christian prophetic television programs, and they talk about wars and everything, they got the music, <laughs> you know, it's all sensationalist, and it stirs fears up in the body. Jesus said, don't be troubled. Look at your neighbor say, don't be troubled. Like right now in the environment, don't be troubled. People trouble, I ain't troubled. Look at your neighbor say, I ain't troubled. We're gonna... <laughs> My mother-in-law, she's in heaven right now, she used to be an English teacher, Mother uh, Grace Riley, she used to sit right over there, and Lord, she would just cringe when I preach because my English is like really bad, as you can tell. Jesus said, be not troubled. Look at your neighbor and say, be not troubled. And this is what he says. He says, for all these things must come to pass. So it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like if you're taking a journey across the country or whatever like that, you're going to see some signs. You know, you're, you know. If, if we were, if we were going to travel across the country, go to California today or whatever, we got in a car, right? One of the first signs we're going to see is entering in to Maryland. But look at your neighbor and say, we ain't there yet. 
So the wars and the troubles, we ain't there yet. Look at the neighbor and say, we ain't there yet. Maybe I should have made that the title of my message there. We ain't there yet. Just mess with all you English teachers. How many English teachers? Any, we got any English teachers in here? Okay, good. As you can tell, me and English teachers didn't get along too well. Mr. Wilson, what's the difference between a noun and a pronoun? I don't know. <laughs> He says, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So let these scriptures come. See, so don't be deceived. If you see all this stuff going on, don't be troubled. The end ain't yet. So if you see somebody get on television or somebody says, oh, you know, Jesus is coming any day now. Look at the neighbor and say, the end is not yet. Now, so some, just me saying that right now could probably cause a little disturbance in the lives of some believers right now. But I'm going to show you some scriptures because we can get a see. The Bible says that no man knows the day nor the hour. God does. Jesus doesn't even know. But we can get an idea of maybe some seeds. And, I, and I, I'm not going to go months or years or anything like that. But we can get an idea that things are starting to heat up a little bit. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. How many of you know there's some famines? And pestilences. Right now, you know, we're dealing with a pestilence. And earthquakes. How many of you know there's earthquakes? In different places. So now, all these things are happening. So guess what the scripture says in verse 8? Look at what the verse 8. Put up verse 8. What's it say? What's this, what, what does Jesus say? Does it say it's the middle? Does it say things are wrapping up? Now, I'm, I'm giving you a very simple message, whatever, like that, but this will keep you from being deceived because these are, these are not the words that Pastor Giff. I'm just giving you a presentation to make it real simple. So, so all this stuff is the beginning of sorrows, but how many times have you heard even ministers say, oh, we're getting close to the, rap, the, the rapture. This is happening. No, Jesus said it's the beginning. So don't even let me deceive you. So if you hear me come along, oh, man, we ain't got much time left. Now, who's the one that authored and penned that scripture? Who penned it? Who wrote it? Who spoke it? Everyone say Jesus. So look at your neighbor and say, don't be deceived. Now, see, some of us that have been Christians for a while, this may, up, this may upset some of our eschatology. This may uh, upset some of our end time understanding or end times or whatever because we've heard people, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downplaying uh, last day studies or, you know, the book. I'm not doing that. I can only, re I, I, I want to be anchored in what Jesus said because uh, the last time I read my Bible, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So everyone say the beginnings. So now, you know, like you, you, we got the issue with China, and I think India's having some issues with China and possibly ta Taiwan and some different things. We got some famines going on. We got some pestilence going on and different things. We earthquakes in, all kind, in different places. The earthquakes quakes kind of calmed down a little bit, but how many of you remember a couple years ago, I mean, there was earthquakes all happening all the time or whatever. They kind of calmed down a little bit. But Jesus said, all these are the beginning. Let's say that again. Everyone say beginning. beginning. That's why he said, don't let your heart be troubled because it's just the beginning. You know, like when you go to a movie or whatever, you know, how, you know um, I don't like watching movies with my wife. Because she talks throughout the whole movie. She wants to know, who you think killed the president? I don't know. I'm watching the movie. This is the first. <laughs> let's, enjoy the, let's enjoy the unfolding of the movie. I think it was the, the butler. I don't know who it was, you know. And it ends up being an airplane pilot or something, something completely different, you know. How many of you, how many of you um, have somebody you watch movies with and they talk throughout the whole movie? You know, just uh, how many of you the one that be asking the questions? Be honest. How many? <laughs> oh, don't go in the closet, you know. I don't watch horror movies anymore, but it's, you know, it's always a dumb person trip over the stone and get killed by the serial killer, you know? So it's like, <laughs> all right, let me get back to the scripture. Verse nine, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now we're starting to see some of those things where people are offended. There's a lot of, I mean, how many of you know with this election, I'm not going, don't, don't ask me who I'm voting for, who I ain't voting for, because I might, some people be happy who I'm voting for, some of y'all might be offended, but just over a, election, a, 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 a voting on a president, people are offended, cursing at each other. I mean, and I'm talking about Christians, so I don't get it to know, uh, don't ask me nothing. Look at the neighbor and say, Jesus. I know who I'm voting for, and that's, and that's who I'm voting for. It says, and shall betray one another and sh shall hate one another. I ain't never seen nothing like it. It's incredible. 
I thought Christians were supposed to pray for those that are in authority. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that? Am I the only one? <laughs> Woo, Lord have mercy, man. Don't say, don't say so-and-so's name or so-and-so's name, man. You can be, woo, I'm going to leave that alone. Verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So that lets, so that lets me know that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be deceived. The only thing that's going to protect people from being deceived is them staying anchored in Jesus Christ and digging for truth. I want to reiterate, truth is not just on the surface. You got to dig for it. And if you dig hard enough, you'll find truth. Everyone say, dig hard enough, you'll find truth. I mean, just to find diamonds, the amount, the tons of, of, of dirt and rock and stone and, and depth that they have to get to to find a diamond. That's how truth is. Truth is precious. It's not just sitting there. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13 but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14. So we're going to put that up. I'm going to read, I got it in my notes and everything. Now look at this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall, everyone say shall. That lets me know that Jesus has a group of people that are under command, a group of people that are motivated by, motivated by compassion and love, just like God was to send Jesus to do this. It says, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what happens? Then what happens? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so what's been happening in my spirit um, the past, you know, about this past year, you know, I've just been spending a lot of time in prayer, just, you know, in, in my personal time. And this, the Lord's just been stirring this in my heart. I've been praying for myself. I've been praying for the body here at Victory. I've been praying for the body of Christ around the world. And I'm not the only one. It's thousands, it's millions of Christians that are praying for the end time harvest because we have the signs the beginning of sorrows. We read the scripture, we have the beginning of sorrows. We have the certain signs that are taking place, but the end is not yet. But the end is not going to come until the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Now, I don't have scripture in verse on this. But suppose we don't have the urgency in the body of Christ to preach the world, preach the gospel to all the world for a witness. Is the end coming? I don't think it is. That's what because Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So if we in the body of Christ we have this me mentality and you know and and uh, you know we don't have this outreach to all the world or whatever, then the end can't come. Well, you can hear a pin can drop in this place. So we need, look at your neighbor and say, we need some people to get busy. Because unfortunately, the things above this verse have a tendency to bring people into a place of self-preservation. I've been there. Or self-concern, or fear, or deception, or apathy. And then guess what? The other 5.3 billion people only have a slight chance of the gospel being preached to them unless you and me embrace the call to carry the call and begin to pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. I mean, it's a big job. Now, I, you know, I, I kind of like to break things down in a practical way or whatever, but, you know, sometimes, you know, it's not going to work that way. So if there's, two, if there's about two billion Christians, if every Christian led about three people to the Lord, we could evangelize the world in a day or two. But how many of you know that's not happening right now? So out of this message, I pray that you allow the Lord to, to, to capture your heart and throughout your week, throughout your day, that you take some time and you begin to pray and say, Lord, I ask you to raise up uh, laborers in India. I ask you to raise up la laborers in, in Yugoslavia and in Indonesia. And, you know, right now, Pastor Gary's in, in Tanzania and he's uh, declaring to them 
the eight aspects of, of his new and living way. We pray that we just don't see. We don't want to just have revelation of his new and living way and just say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Praise God. And, you know, we say, I'm so glad Jesus set me free. And we're all self. You know, I hate to say it. A lot of our worship songs and praise and worship are self-centered. <laughs> I'm just a little spoon in the body of Christ just to stir you up. That's all. And we need to take that world vision. There's Jesus has a world vision. God had a world vision for God so loved the world. And begin to pray that believers all across the world have a vision for their world. Let's read on. I've got a few couple verses left here. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, unto every ethnic group, and then shall the end come. So right now, if we were to take a and, 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 and just be, you know, just be honest. If we were to take, kind of take an assessment of, of, the, of the climate that's around or whatever like that, can we honestly say that there's really a focus on end-time evangelism? Can we really say that? But guess what? It's about to happen. You and I are on the beginning stages. We're on the beginning, uh, we're be, we're, we're, I believe that God is going to use us to be like an igniter that ignites the flames here in this state and across this country and across the world. We're not just praying for the United States of America. I remember one time, I'll never forget it, early in my, early in my walk with the Lord, um, one of the first times that Bishop Itahosa came to the church, he said, God is not American. See, American Christians, and I'm not trying to beat anybody up, American Christians or whatever, you know, we think almost the world revolves around us. Like we got, we got the, you know, like we cornered the market on Christianity. And it's not. Jesus loves the world. I've had the opportunity to be to a lot of nations or whatever, and it's amazing the power of God moves in Ireland just like it moves in America. There's powerful men and women of God in Ireland and, and in Ghana and Nigeria and, and Australia and New Zealand, all across the world. And I want to encourage you to embrace this call of Jesus Christ. I want us to go to, uh, and this is coming out a little bit differently, I want us to go to Luke chapter 10, and I'm going to have to wrap it up here. Luke chapter 10. So tell your neighbors, say, don't be deceived. And see, that'll bring, see, if you, if you understand what Jesus said, you won't be all flipped out, you won't be all nervous, you won't be all troubled, all fearful, because you go, oh, no, you can, and you can, you can help your family members out, other Christians. Oh, don't be troubled right now, it's just, this, this, oh, this is just the beginning, just calm down. Let's go out soul winning, let's lead some people to Jesus. You don't need to go out to Walmart this weekend and spend $900 on food and everything like that. About $200, that, that'll get you through, you know. Don't run your credit cards up. I, man, I could tell you stories. And see, you know, to be honest with you, that was one of the things that I struggled as a little boy because the Chris, they were so weird. They would sing all these songs about, you know, Jesus and different things, but they didn't tell nobody about it. It's like they just kind of hunkered down. You know, they, they wanted to go in the basements and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, people were building um, uh, bomb shelters. <laughs> okay, okay. Wasted their money. They could have been sewn into the gospel of Jesus Christ for evangelism. Now, I know you probably think, oh, Pastor Giff, you're being sacrilegious. No, I'm being Jesus. I'm going to do what Jesus says. Luke chapter 10, and we've got to close with this. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city. Everyone say every city. I shared this last week. It was, it was, it was a real blessing because I shared this last Sunday. Jesus is, giving, Jesus is giving us access into places where we have never had access before, every city. Don't ever think that there's anything restricted to you. And then Pastor Gary, on, I think it was either Monday or Tuesday, he gets on, he shares the same thing. Pastor Mary was like, did you hear what Pastor Gary said? You know, and that we're have, we're gonna have, believers are going to have access everywhere. See, if you, and we don't have time to get, go there today. In Mark chapter 16, if you go down to the end there, around verse 14, I believe, through 20, it says, after Jesus spoke to his disciples, he said they went everywhere preaching the gospel, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So it says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face in every city. Everyone say every city. And place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. Now I already explained to you that there's 5.5 billion people left on the planet that have not had a relationship, that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They might be Buddhists or different, you know, or they might be atheists. But we got a big job to do. It says, truly the harvest is great, 
But listen to this, the laborers are few. And I thought about that. Why is the laborers are few? Maybe because they're getting caught up in some of those things in Matthew chapter 24. Maybe they're getting caught up in the signs of the times. Maybe they're getting caught up being troubled. Maybe they're getting caught up in, in self-preservation. And what about me? And, you know, and fear and, and doubt and unbelief and all these things. He says, but pray ye the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors into his harvest. Now, you know, that scripture, to me, that scripture, Jesus kind of gives us out. He's like, okay, the harvest is great. The labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into the harvest. Now, and I've been there before when I first got saved. I was like, oh, I can do that. Lord, send labors into the harvest. <laughs> and that's what I did. I mean, but guess what? Then I started saying, Lord, send me. And so I don't want you to just leave it at that today. Lord, because see, we could, we, how many of y'all know we could pray up a storm? Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Send them into the, send them by the highways and the Bible. I remember, you know, um, I used to love my mother and my dad. They would be praying sometimes. They would be praying like that. But one thing I can say about my parents, they used to do street meetings in Philly, up in the hood and everything and stuff like that. They, you know, I was embarrassed when I was a little kid and everything, but now I got the same. I'm worse than my parents. <laughs> you talked about radical. My parents are radical. So they rubbed off. They rubbed, they must, their prayers must have worked and everything. I love soul winning. Look at their neighbor and say, I love soul winning. So listen to this. Don't just pray for the Lord to send labors in the harvest. Pray that the Lord uses you. You know why? Because you're going to see some of the greatest miracles release through your life. See, when you go, listen to this. When you go, he shows who he is. He demonstrates. I don't have time. Listen, I don't have time. Literally, I don't know, probably, I, I could probably share, I could probably talk for probably five to ten hours just about testimonies I've seen, you know, being out soul winning with Re Reverend Way, Ray or by myself or with some of the teens or different things or whatever. I'll share one real quick and then we got to, I got to wrap this up. Um, and this was a while back when I used to pastor youth ministry. We did a, we were doing a cross country trip to a, to a uh, youth ministry, a youth camp. And we were on a bus. You know, we, we had two bus loads of kids and everything and stuff. And um, there's a highway. I think it's on the border of, I want to say Texas. No, I mean Oklahoma and Arkansas, I believe. And there's a McDonald's that goes over the highway. They built the McDonald's over the highway. You park downstairs, you go up these steps, and the McDonald's is a, it's like a four-lane highway and everything. So we went up there. And, and one thing you got to know, obviously you can tell I'm loud and everything. And I was worse. I'm a little bit more calmer now <laughs> when I was a teenager. So... We come in, we come into the McDonald's. Now imagine this, about 90 kids, we're coming into, we're coming into McDonald's like this. Hail, I, I'm at the front. Hail Jesus, you're my king. And they're going, hail Jesus, you're my king. You're like, so you got all these kids, so all these people are looking around. And we just took over the whole McDonald's and everything, right? And so anyhow, you know, we order our food, we got our food. And so anyhow, the kids, they started walking around um, uh, preaching to people and everything like that. And we probably led about 30 people to the Lord that day, but it was one kid that we walked up to. And we started talking. He wasn't a kid. He was about maybe in his mid-20s and everything. So we led him to the Lord. And so anyhow, he said, well, where are you guys from? He said, we're, we're from Delaware. And he said, oh, my aunt lives in Delaware. He, I said, oh, yeah, where? He said, in Newcastle. He said, her name is Mrs. Brown. I said, Mrs. Brown? He said, yeah. He said, she's a palm reader in Newcastle. So y'all know that little palm, there used to be a palm reading place up the street. That was her nephew that we led to the Lord all the way in Oklahoma. See, there is no secret what God can do. He wants to do some things in your life. Let's stand on our feet today. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord praise that we're in this generation. We're going to lead people to Jesus. I said we're going to lead some people to Jesus. Come on, lift your hands right now. I just sense his presence right now. There's, you know, who you love, you talk about. <laughs> Woo! Come on, just lift your hands right now. There's just an anointing in this place right now. Father, we thank you for the fire, the zeal of God that has consumed us. Jesus, you have raised us up in this generation to be a voice. To be a voice. I want you to make this declaration this morning. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you are sending laborers into your harvest all across this world. You're sending me. I thank you that I am full of compassion. I thank you for the boldness. I thank you for the fire that you place within my spirit. Jesus, I thank you that when I open my mouth, you fill it. I thank you, Lord, right now for the divine appointments. I thank you for the lives 
that will be transformed. Jesus, I embrace your call. Father, I embrace your call. I'm going everywhere you send me. Every barrier, every limitation is broken. I have access to penetrate different environments with your gospel. And Lord, I thank you that as I go, you confirm your word with signs following in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, and let's put our hands together right now. Give the Lord praise and glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 You can be seated. I don't have time to get in today, so we're, um, we're working on a, on a worldwide strategy. I believe right now we got a couple different acronyms, but it's probably going to be Jesus Experience Global Evangelism Team or Global Strategy and uh, Global uh, Soul Winning Initiative, something along those lines. But already... It's a, it's a blessing. Already I have people contacting me from Canada. I just talked to a good brother. He might be, uh, Steve might be watching. He's on, um, he lives in Oregon or Oregon. I don't know how you say it. And he said he wants to be a, like a state coordinator. So just keep it in prayer. We're going to have state coordinators. We're going to have coordinators in every nation that's going to take place. And uh, just keep it in prayer. You know, just stand in prayer with me because I've, I've never done anything this big. But, you know, this is what new, what's new and next. God's going to surround. We're going to have an app. That uh, when somebody gets saved, they can go right to the app store, put that app on the phone, and it'll direct them to uh, Pastor's 10 a.m. Uh, teaching time, and they can, they can join the prayer call. There'll be a link where they can go directly to His New and Living Way, Living Way, and Your Liberty in Christ, and they'll have that right from Jump Street and everything. So we're going to do something. <clears throat> the way that we're able to do these things and reach the world is because we have people that love this world and love this, love the lost, and they honor God with their giving. They honor God with their tithes and with their offerings. And that's, you know, what I love about this ministry, yes, we have salaries that we have to pay, but a, a, a good majority of our finances goes into outreach. It goes into blessings, dressing, and more. It goes into evangelism outreach. It's about to go into this uh, global evangelism strategy. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, if you need an offering envelope, they're in your bulletins. You can give by push pay. Those of you that are online there, you can use push pay, or there's a giving uh, button right next to the browser there where the, you see the program today. And I love the scripture in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. It says, honor the Lord with thy substance. Every time we give, we honor the Lord. It's a way that we love on the Lord. It's a way that we worship the Lord. And it says, uh, and the first fruits of all your increase, so shall your barns be filled with plenty, and thy precious shall burst out with new wine. And so anytime we honor the Lord with our substance, God promises us that he will cause increase to take place in our life. Amen. So we're going to pray, and then uh, the ushers are going to bring the buckets up there. We're going to pray in just a moment. And I'm going to have Pastor Judy. You're going to come up, Pastor Judy? We've got some wonderful things going on. Uh, once you're prepared to give, um, after, uh, after I'm um, done praying over the offering, you can come and you can, be, you can come right up the side aisles and you can go right back out. You can bring your tithes and your offerings in just a moment. Father, we thank you for the awesome, awesome privilege that we have to honor you with our giving. And Lord, we thank you for the passion that you've given each one of us, Lord, to see nations one into a personal relationship with you, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we honor you with our tithes and with our offerings, Father God, we ask you to receive it bathed in honor and love and reverence and in worship because you're such an awesome God, you're such a faithful God, and, and we love you so much. And Lord, we thank you right now that you multiplied our seed into people's lives, Lord, so that we can see this, this, this earth reach with your gospel. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen.